So don't mind me, I, I'm just checking you all out because I want to see who's here because it's quite stressful getting up here and not being able to see anybody, right? So if any of you leave during my talk or like fall asleep, I'm going to know because I've seen you now. <laughs> so for those of you who don't know, this is a monocular telescope. This allows me to see you the way that you can see me. And if you're wondering why I can't see, I have albinism. I'm an albino but I am the only person who is allowed to use that word. I call myself many things. I call myself a scientist, a researcher, a human being, a woman, someone's mother, even somebody's ex-wife. But an albino, no. Because although I am a person with albinism, my condition does not define me. And there is something else that you can call me, visually impaired. So although most people know that albinism causes people who are very, very pale, like I am. In South Africa, we're used to seeing black people with albinism, but surprise, surprise, every racial group has albinism, including people who are Indian, Russian, Chinese, everybody. It's a universal disorder. Um, so the reason that we are so pale is because we don't have melanin, which is the brown pigments in your skin and your hair and your eyes. But what most people don't know is that melanin is a vital signaling molecule during the development of your optic nerve and your eye during embryogenesis. So before babies with albinism are even born, their eyes are not developed correctly and their optic nerves are not wired properly. So I, I'm a scientist, I like to give things numbers and I'd like to kind of try and explain to you why, what my eyesight is like. So I have a full field of vision, I can see everywhere. I can kind of see my hands over there, but not really, but I'll pretend I can. And, um, but I have to be 10 times closer to an object than you do. So my number for my, my eyes is 660. So a normal person is 66. So 660 means that what you can see from six meters away, I need, um, sorry, what you can see from 60 meters away, I need to be six meters away. So that means I work with everything over here. And if I can get it close enough to my face, I can generally work with it. Um, so now that I've told you that I'm disabled, uh, I often have this sense of responsibility towards people that I talk to when I talk about my disability. I feel like I need to motivate you and inspire you and tell you like, life's really, really, really tough. But if you have the right mindsets and you try hard enough, you can do anything in the world. So if you are expecting me to give that talk, I have to be upfront with you. You can leave now <laughs> because I very nearly called this talk how to fail miserably at everything, okay? So I have been failing for a very long time. Um, I failed to grasp objects when I was six months old and I was diagnosed as being completely blind, even though I can see a little bit. Um, at a year, I failed to walk because, you know, kind of walking when you can't see where you're going is a little bit stressful. So I thought that's not for me. But my biggest failure would come from then on in life and that failure would be the failure to fit in. So I'm gonna try and take you through my life and what it's been like, and I hope you'll come on the journey, and I can't promise any ha happy endings, because I'm still working on it, but I I if you'd like to come, I'll, I'll start with my childhood. Um, I don't really have very many happy, fond memories of my childhood. So aside from my severe visual disability, um, I am not allowed to go in the sun. Or so in the 1980s, it was thought that if you let a child with albinism into the sun, they would die of skin cancer immediately. Um, luckily, we have SPF 100 now, and I, I venture out there into the world. I even ran comrades this year. I was out there for 12 hours, and, and I didn't die. Um, yay! Woo. Thank you. So, as a consequence of, of being very sun sensitive, I was not allowed out during 10 and 2 during the day as a child, unless it was overcast. So I spent the vast majority of my time as a child indoors alone, which is kind of not nice now that I think about it. At the time, it was just normal. It was what it was. Um, but then when I went to school, 
I suddenly realized that I had this thing, this thing that made me different, this thing that other kids didn't like. And um, I was bullied horrendously. Um, I was called a monster. I was told I was a freak. Um, other children wouldn't play with me. And again, because I wasn't allowed outdoors during the day, and also because I couldn't see, I would spend my recess or break time inside, literally sitting two feet away from the blackboard, copying down what the other children would have done during class. So it was quite a, a, a lonely existence, shall I say. But when I got to high school, things got exponentially worse. So now you can imagine you've all started out in high school and you're an awkward teenager and you're, you're scared you're weird, but now I'm properly weird. I'm this, this pale girl and I, and I have to read everything like this. And people think I'm stupid, which is really, I think that's something that I've spent a lot of my life trying to overcome because I spend a lot of my time looking like this. Okay, but I'm not stupid. Um, I, my IQ is within the top 2% of the world. In standardized testing, <laughs> I am in the 99.9th percentile for maths and English. When I got to high school, however, I was so disoriented and overwhelmed that I went from a straight-A student to basically failing everything, because remember, that's the theme here. We're failing at everything. Um, I was bullied to the extent that I, I couldn't go to school anymore. I didn't want to. Um, the school was very large, and I, I couldn't find my way around. Just getting from one building to another was very confusing for me. I have a lot of problems with facial recognition, so I wouldn't know people who would approach me. So everyone just thought I was weird and unpleasant, and I was that stupid albino girl. Like, nobody wanted to talk to me. So just to give you a condensed version of my high school careers, which is, is horrible for me to have to talk about. In two years, I went through three schools, three failed suicide attempts, and one decision that would hurt me for the next 20 years of my life. I decided I didn't want to have albinism anymore. I didn't want to be partially sighted. I was just going to carry on like normal because this was not working out for me. So I dropped out of school, I dyed my hair a nice dark brown, I did my eyebrows and my eyelashes. I said, I'm from England, I'm just naturally pale, and oh, I never wear my glasses, that's why I can't see. And I pulled it off, but not very well. I learned that I could be loved and accepted as long as I wasn't me. The other thing that I did was having dropped out of school, I completed my final year of school when I was just after I turned 16, so I skipped two years of school, which makes me sound really clever, but it wasn't really such a clever thing to do. So with no support or proper schooling, I, although I did pass my final year of school, I got 33% for mathematics. 33%, I'm really saying that. And yes, I did get a PhD in biochemistry in the end. But that was hard. And I had to figure out, this isn't working for me. How do I make this work? So I went back and I did my A-levels. And again, I was still missing all of this information that I should have had in the two years that I missed. But I managed to get 50%. And that was what I needed to go and start a Bachelor of Science. And I went to go and study genetics. And I think that I had this innate interest in what made me so weird. Why am I broken? Why is everybody else OK? What is it in my genes that does this? So I never told anyone when I was doing my undergraduate that I couldn't see because I was terrified they would tell me I couldn't be in the labs. So I would just fail things if I couldn't see. I never told anybody. I sat in lectures and I listened to every word that a lecturer said. I never took notes because I couldn't see what was on the PowerPoint presentations. And I would often put my head down because then I could hear better if I wasn't concentrating on trying to see. So my lecturers generally thought I was this complete anomaly. There's this girl that sleeps through every lecture and she gets like 80% for the exams. What is going on? So when I finished my bachelor's degree, I um, worked in a lab where the woman who was running the lab did understand that I couldn't see because she was a geneticist. I have the most common genetic disorder in the southern hemisphere. 
Somebody somewhere was bound to figure out that I couldn't see. And I worked in her lab, and I used to go in early, and I left late, and I just found a way to work in the lab that worked for me. So I had to learn how to measure small volumes of liquid by putting things close to my face and knowing how, what the space was in between each of the tubes. But I made it work. And then, after having done my honors, I continued to do my master's and my PhD. And in that space, I, I was much more comfortable. I had a very understanding supervisor, and I, I, I started to tell people that I couldn't see, because obviously I needed to do that to be able to perform. So in July 2015, I finished my PhD. And that was a major achievement. You guys are making me so excited. I had like second round of applause, wow. Okay, <laughs> you're gonna give me a big head. And I thought, wow, I've really struggled. I did what I needed to do. This was what was so important. And I've made it. I'm going to go out there and I'm going to do awesome stuff. And then I couldn't find a job. And I, I struggled. I really, really, really struggled. And I think a lot of people have been in that situation. But I had the added bonus of being bright enough to get divorced directly before I finished my PhD. So I ended up in a situation where I had no job, I had no husband, I had a small child, I had no money, I had no home, I had no possessions. And I thought, wow, I'm really failing at everything. But you know what, I read Harvard Business Review, I know, like if you just fail hard enough and often enough, you can become Steve Jobs or Bill Gates, right? But it wasn't happening to me, so I started feeling like I was failing at failing. And I did that thing that everybody said you shouldn't do. I said things cannot get any worse than this. And they did. I got a job, but I got a job in corporate management consulting at a small firm, and they ate me alive. I would say, I don't want to copy and paste all of these documents all the time. Can I write new documents? Can we come up with a new process? Because we're introducing a lot of errors every time we use this process. Yeah, but you can't see and you're inaccurate. I would say to them, your software is giving us blatantly inaccurate numbers. And they would say to me, yeah, but you can't see and you're inaccurate. So this conversation ended um, in, in a way which I'm actually legally not allowed to discuss in public, <laughs> which was a tragedy, because I'm an asset to anyone who can use me. So I just want to give you an idea of, on a daily basis, what I have to do. If I need to go to work, and I need to go and train, so I need to go to the gym, and I need to go to um, swim, I've got to figure out how can I Uber to get to these places as efficiently as possible. I need to minimize distance, which means minimizing cost, and I need to uh, get to as many places as possible. Do you know what that's called? It's called linear programming. It's where you have multiple equations with the same variables, and you try to optimize them under constraints. Do you know who does that? Actuarial scientists. Do you know how much they get paid? A lot. And that's something I have to do every day while you guys find your car keys. So I'm an asset that's not being used, but I can tell you that being, under, being unemployed at home, I was much better off than I was in a job where I was underemployed. So I got the opportunity to make my own space, and my space wasn't a space of round pegs and square holes. My space is star-shaped. And the next time somebody tells me that I don't belong there, I'm going to say, hey, you're dampening my sparkle. So I managed to start an NPO, and I managed to get involved in research which will help other people like me be able to go through the schooling system without the struggles that I did. So if you came here to be inspired, I hope I've made you feel warm and fuzzy. But more than that, I hope that I've changed the way that you see people who are different to you. The next time you see somebody like me, instead of saying, why are you so weird? Say, who are you and how did you get here? Instead of saying, you don't belong here, say, where are you going, and can I come with you? Because in a society where people like me are excluded, I have to fight tooth and nail to move forward while you stand still. But in an inclusive society, we can all move forward together.
Thank you.